learning outcomes. This module shall enable you to learn and understand the following. Developing nations and WTO groups formed by developing nations, special and differential treatment provisions, deadlock being faced by the World Trade Organization, the collapse, agreement on agriculture, AOA, Doha Development Agenda, DDA, issues, emerging matters and challenges, WTO and India. Introduction The World Trade Organization became a living entity on January 1, 1995 as a worldwide organization headquartered at Geneva, Switzerland. It made a successfully shifted form from negotiation approach of CAT which was just an informal device to handle international trade since 1948. GATT was temporary in nature whereas WTO is a permanent organization legislated as an outcome of the Uruguay round of GATT 1986-94. It has around 153 members. Its formal languages are English, Spanish and French with its headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland. WTO's Organizational structure is the Ministerial Conference MC. It is the apex governing body which decides on all issues by meeting at least once after every two years. MC is represented by trade ministers of all member countries. The General Council GC, the Trade Policy Analysis Body, the Dispute Settlement Body, the Councils on Trade in Goods and Trade in Services, the Secretariat and Director General, the Committee on Trade and Development and Committee are its other major components. It is responsible for governing the international trade system among member nations. It is a means to achieve further liberalization of international trade that is to make global trade trouble free and more favorable for member countries under an institutional framework. Governing the international trade system among member nations is its major responsibility. It is considered to be a guiding light to liberalize international trade but like any other organization it also faces hindrances and bottlenecks. Below we shall try and discuss such issues. Developing Nations and WTO Let us first look down the history of WTO to understand its present condition in regard to its relationship with the developing and underdeveloped world with beginning of the Uruguay round the attitude of developing nations towards taking part in the GATT and subsequently in the WTO changed significantly in many ways. These ways constituted of a number developing states started playing a very active role in the Uruguay round negotiations. A major chunk decided to become members of WTO and so on. As a result, a number of complex and interrelated developments took place. Developing countries in general became more effectively integrated in the international trading system and several also become major exporters of manufacturers across the world. Liberalized trade policies, outward orientation and increased importance of observing international rules in the conduct of trade and lower protection were being undertaken in many nations. With the establishment of the World Trade Organization, further changes started taking place in relation to placing additional demands on developing countries for their effective participation. These included coverage of a variety of new areas such as services, standards, intellectual property rights, negotiations on basic telecommunications, information technology products and financial services etc. All was going well but an area of concern was and still exists is that whether developing countries have an adequate representation at the WTO for pursuing of their effective participation in the activities and the promotion of their interest in the expanding range in the organization. This issue has a special importance because the WTO like the GATT is a member driven organization. The silver lining is a large chunk of WTO's members are developing nations. These nations play an important and active role as their importance is growing in the global economy and because of a growth in their efforts to enhance trade as a vital tool in their development. Participation also helps these nations in dealing with an international problem. 
offer a common regime for international transactions. Moreover, least developed countries have asked for duty free and quota free access for their products and for such treatment to be bound under the WTO. Both these issues still remain outstanding. Another related issue is LDC is to be granted exemptions from tariff and subsidy reduction commitments. Similarly, addressing of trade related technical assistance TRTA is also a key concern of LDCs. Various examples can be quoted of how the WTO has failed the poor. Some of these examples are as below. Agricultural subsidies beyond cotton. WTO members could not conclude upon how to decrease the huge subsidies paid to rich world farmers who threaten the livelihood of farmers of the developing world. Trade agreements. It failed to simplify the deliberately confusing rules on closing trade agreements that allowed the rich states to manipulate the poorest. Special treatment. The rules for developing countries called special and differential treatment rules were supposed to be looked up to make them more precise, effective and operational. But the WTO has failed to take them up. Next, medicine. The poorest in developing countries are not able to access affordable medicines as members have failed to clarify confusions between the need for governments to protect public health on one hand and on the other to protect the intellectual property rights of pharmaceutical companies. Legal cost. As pledged by WTO to improve availability to its expensive and complex legal system but has failed. Protectionist economic policy. As agreed by one of the WTO's five core functions at its inception in 1995 to achieve more coherence in global economic policy making. Yet the WTO failed to curb the speedy increase in the number of protectionist measures. Decision making. Most of the decisions of the WTO are made by consensus which eventually becomes difficult given its member composition. As long as small and poor remain voiceless, the role of campaigning organizations which are working together will remain critical. Next, groups formed by developing nations. G20 Developing Nations The G20, popularly known as the Group of 20 and occasionally the G21, the G23 or G20+, plus, is a block of developing nations established on 28th August 2003 at the 5th Ministerial WTO Conference held in Cancun, Mexico from 10th September to 14th September 2003, the group came into existence. 60% of the world's population, 70% of its farmers and 26% of world's agricultural exports is what the G20 accounts for. Its origin came from the signing of declaration known as the Brasilia Declaration by the foreign ministers from Brazil India and South Africa on June 6, 2003. But the official appearance of the G20 occurred as a response to a text released on 13 August 2003 by the European Communities EC and the United States with a common proposal on agriculture for the Cancan Ministry. A document signed on 20th August 2003 by 20 countries and reissued as a Cancun ministerial document on 4th September proposed an alternative framework to that of the EC and the United States on agriculture for the Cancun meeting hence making the establishment of the G20. The original group of signatories of the 20th August 2003 document went through many changes being known as such different names as the G21 or the G22. The title G20 was finally chosen in honor of the date of the group's establishment. Since its creation, the, mem I repeat, the group has had a fluctuating membership. Previous members have included Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, El Salvador, Peru and Turkey. As of October 2008, the group had 23 members. Next. G33 Developing Countries A group of developing countries, the G33, coordinates on trade and economic issues created in order to help a group of countries that were all facing similar problems. Special rules were proposed for developing countries at WTO negotiations, like allowing them to continue 
to restrict access to their agricultural markets. Despite the name, there are currently 46 member nations including India, Pakistan, etc. Next is special and differential treatment provisions. Provisions are contained in the WTO agreements which give developing countries special rights called as special and differential treatment provisions. At the 4th WTO Ministerial Conference in Doha, the ministers mandated the Committee on Trade and Development to examine these special and differential treatment provisions. In December 2013, the Bali Ministerial Conference established a mechanism to review and analyze the implementation of special and differential treatment provisions. The special provisions include longer time periods for implementing agreements and commitments, measures to increase trading opportunities for developing countries, provisions requiring all WTO members to safeguard the trade interest of developing countries, support to help developing countries build the capacity to carry out WTO work, handle disputes and implement technical standards and provisions related to least developed country LDC members. Several compilations were made by the WTO Secretariat for the special and differential provisions and their use. Next, deadlock faced by the World Trade Organization. First, the Doha Ministerial Conference has always been a bone of contention and a factor of controversies from its very beginning. The WTO Doha round of multilateral trade negotiations began in November 2001 and many years have passed since then. In the 2012, a group of negotiators continuously tried to break the deadlock in the Doha development agenda with some progress made in a number of areas notably in trade facilitation, agriculture and dispute settlement. The arbitrations were characterized by differences among the United States, the European Union and developing countries on major issues which included agriculture, industrial tariffs and non-tariff barriers, services and trade remedies etc. Developing nations which constitute emerging economic powerhouses such as China, Brazil and India had sought a decrease in agriculture tariffs and subsidies among developed countries without reciprocal market access for manufacturing sectors and protection of their services industries. The members had a unanimous desire to deliver a positive outcome at the 9th Ministerial Conference in Bali, Indonesia in December 2013 and agreed to work continuously towards pinpointing some accords to deliver to the ministerial meeting. Members were adamant to any make a milestone and to gather momentum for the full closing of the Doha round. Yet, despite a lot of efforts, the round remains deadlocked. Second, in early 2012, at the suggestion of then chair Louis Visescha of Switzerland, the negotiating group on market access for non agriculture products, NAMA resumed discussions on tariffs which had been sidelined in the past few years. But little progress was made on tariffs or on non-tariff barriers NTB. Members were directed to intensify their efforts at the arrival of the new chair Remigi Winzap of Switzerland in 2013 for a successful NAMA negotiation to enhance participation of their companies in or became part of a regional or global value chain. At the same time, it was equally apparent that the rest of the members were not willing to discard a text they have spent 10 years negotiating. Still various options were being tied which include the possible introduction of safety walls which could give members the confidence to be more ambitious on tariff cutting. Over the past years, the negotiating group has mainly spent time on the various non-tariff barrier NTB proposals and on conducting a text-based negotiation on some of them. However, since the beginning of 2012, some members had declared work cannot continue in isolation from the tariff negotiation. As a result, the deadlock in tariffs has spread to NTBs. Third, the Doha Development Agenda makes it compulsory for notifying and registering geographical indications GIs for wines and spirits for the negotiations on multilateral system. The Council for Trade Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights, TRIPS, carries out the negotiations in special session. 
the Hong Kong Ministerial Declaration mandates the Director General to consult on certain TRIPS related implementation issues identified in the Doha Declaration. Negotiations remain deadlock on notifying and registering geographical indications GIS for wines and spirits. Again in December, Yonak Frederick Agha of Nigeria, the new chair of the TRIPS Council special sessions which handle the negotiations, said the biggest tumbling block is differences of opinion over the mandate, including whether talks should only be about wines and spirits as originally mandated or whether other products could be added. Delegations are also divided on, among other things, the consequences of registration and whether the register applies to all members or only those agreeing to it. The TRIPS agreement mandates negotiations on establishing a register and work has continued since 1996. In April 2011, the then chair Darlington Mwapape of Zamibia circulated a draft composite tax. But still, a lot remains to be done. Other stumbling blocks are the consequences of registration and whether the register would apply to all WTO members or only those electing to take part. Opposition by some delegates starting work unless mandate has formally anchored in the draft composite text. Next, the collapse. There have been various collapses in the journey of the WTO. The major ones are discussed below. First, the Kankan Ministerial. There are several reasons for the Kankan Ministerial. These include differences over the Singapore issues seemed incapable of resolution. The question was raised whether some countries had come to Kankan with a serious intention to negotiate or not as few countries showed no flexibility in their positions and only repeated their demands rather than talk about trade-offs. There were wide difference between developing and developed countries across virtually all topics were a major obstacle. Criticism was raised regarding the procedures as some claimed the agenda to be complicated. The failure to advance the round resulted in a serious loss of momentum and brought into question whether the 1st January 2005 deadline would be met. The North-South divide was most prominent on issues of agriculture. Second, agriculture. The negotiations came down over matters of agricultural trade between the United States, India and China. The disagreement between India and the United States over the Special Safeguard Mechanism SSM, could not be solved regarding the major design to safeguard poor farmers by allowing countries to impose a special tariff on certain agricultural goods in the event of an import surge or price fall. Next, Agreement on Agriculture The Agreement on Agriculture It is an international treaty of the World Trade Organization. It was negotiated during the Uruguay round of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. But it entered into force with the establishment of the WTO on January 1, 1995. The three pillars of agreement on agriculture are domestic support, market access and export subsidies. The agreement has seen criticism from civil society groups for reducing tariff protections for small farmers, a key source of income in developing countries, while simultaneously allowing rich countries to continue subsidizing agriculture at home. NGOs have also criticized the agreement for categorizing subsidies into trade distorting domestic subsidies, the amber box, which have to be reduced and non-trade distorting subsidies, blue and green boxes, which escape discipline and thus can be increased. International Center for Trade and Sustainable Development ICTST 2009 book showed how green box subsidies distorted trade affecting developing country farmers and harming the environment. While some green box payments only had a minor effect on production and trade, others have a significant impact. According to country's latest official reports to the WTO, the United States provided $76 billion more than 90% of total spending in green box payments in 2007. While the European Union notified 48 billion euros, that is $91 billion in 2005, around half of all support. 
the EU's large and growing green box spending was decoupled from income support which could lead to a significant impact on production and trade. At the 2005 WTO meeting in Hong Kong, countries agreed to eliminate export subsidy and equivalent payments by 2030. Next is Doha Development Agenda DDA. The Doha Development Round or Doha Development Agenda DDA is the current trade negotiation round of the World Trade Organization. It commenced in November 2001. It came into being under then Director General Mike Murray with the objective to lower trade barriers around the world and thus facilitate increased global trade. Since 2008, talks have come to a halt over a divide on major issues such as agriculture, industrial tariffs and non-tariff barriers, services and trade remedies. Significant differences exist between developed nations led by the European Union, EU, the United States, USA and Japan and the major developing countries led and represented mainly by India, Brazil, China and South Africa. Also, there is considerable contention against and between the EU and the USA over the maintenance of agricultural subsidies seen to operate effectively as trade barriers. In 2001, the Doha round began with a ministerial level meeting in Doha, Qatar with subsequent ministerial meetings in Cancun, Mexico 2003 and Hong Kong 2005 where related negotiations took place in Paris, France 2005, Potsdam, Germany 2007 and Geneva, Switzerland 2004, 2006 and 2008. The July 2008 negotiations broke down after falling to reach a compromise on agricultural import rules with intense negotiations mostly between the USA, China and India ending in 2008 seeking agreement on negotiation modality and impasse which was not then resolved. The then Director General Pascal Lemmy in April 2011 asked members to think hard about the consequences of throwing away 10 years of solid multilateral work. But no, significant progress has eventuated from the negotiations. The WTO seems determined to persist with them. Next, issues. During the course of WTO, various issues have cropped up. These issues are discussed as under agriculture. Agriculture has become the most important and controversial issue as developing countries have a priority towards it. The first proposal in Qatar in 2001 called for the end agreement to commit to substantial improvements in market access, reductions and ultimate elimination of all forms of export subsidies and substantial reductions in trade distorting support. A more generous offer for reducing trade distorting Domestic support for agriculture was asked by the European Union, EU and the developing countries led by Brazil and India from the United States still remains pending. Next, access to patented medicines. Agreement on trade related aspects of intellectual property rights trips was a major topic at the Doha Ministerial. The issue has an involvement of balance of interest between the pharmaceutical companies in developed countries that held patents on medicines and the public health needs in developing countries. As claimed by the United States before the Doha meeting, the current language in TRIPS was flexible enough to address health emergencies. But other countries insisted on new language. WTO members reached agreement on the TRIPS and medicines issue. Voting in the General Council, member governments approved a decision that offered an interim waiver under the TRIPS agreement allowing a member country to export pharmaceutical products made under compulsory licenses to least develop and certain other members. Next, special and differential treatment. In the Doha ministerial declaration, the trade ministers reaffirmed special and differential SND treatment for developing countries and agreed that all SND treatment provisions. The negotiations have been divided along developing country, developed country. Developing countries wanted to negotiate on changes to SND provisions, keep proposals together in the Committee on Trade and Development and set shorter deadlines. Developed countries wanted to study SND provisions, send some proposals to negotiating groups and leave deadlines open. 
developing countries claim that the developed countries were not negotiating in good faith, while developed countries agreed that the developing countries were unreasonable in their proposals. At the December 2005, Hong Kong ministerial members agreed to five SND provisions for least developed countries LDCs, including the duty-free and quota-free access. Next, implementation issues. Lack of technical assistance and limited capacity led developing countries to claim that they faced problems during the implementation of various agreements. They also claimed that they had not realized certain benefits that they had expected from the round, such as increased excess for their textiles and apparel in developed country markets. They seek a clarification of language relating to their interest in existing agreements. Apart from monitoring the progress in the implementation of the provisions and dictates of the TRIPS agreement in all member countries, the WTO is faced with the problem of finalizing the Doha round mooted in 2001 at the Inter-Ministerial Conference at Doha. The hurdles were faced by the Trade Negotiations Committee, particularly in the areas of free market access, agriculture and tariff rationalization are indeed very wide. Next, emerging issues and challenges. There is a need to ask various questions. Is the WTO still relevant and useful? Can we still make a settlement with the WTO? What needs to be done to revamp it? What is the relevance of the Doha agenda in the present day? What new and potential issues does the multilateral system need to consider and how? Is a change needed in the way to negotiate with the WTO? What relationship should be established between the multilateral trading system and preferential agreements? What is the position of the WTO in the broader context of global governance? After 10 years of complex negotiations with few substantive dividends expressed in policy, the WTO's established rules, principles and practices have been found to be simply insufficient or new agreements on trade ill-suited to the fast-changing challenges of our times. By the critics, in light of the above situation, WTO's Doha round of negotiations discussed focused on approaches to move cooperation forward. These include the need to rethink the single undertaking principle looking at options such as variable geometry agreements, including the so-called plurilateral and critical mass agreements. In the absence of progress, several countries have also envisaged the possibility of negotiating plurilateral agreements outside of the WTO. In the current situation, the best approach would be to strengthening the functioning of the multilateral trading system while guaranteeing its fairness, predictability, universality and effectiveness. However, international policy frameworks such as the WTO disciplines on agriculture have traditionally focused on trade distortions associated with low price markets and production surpluses but largely failed to address problems associated with production shortages and high prices for food and farm products. Not to mention market shifts and issues resulting from climate change, land scarcity and water scarcity increasingly challenging agriculture production. Today, in the absence of effective cooperative arrangements, certain unilateral trade policy measures might excavate tensions between resource endowed countries and those that depend on reliable and predictable markets. In particular, where essential commodities such as food and energy are concerned. In this respect, what should be the role of the WTO in addressing issues such as preserve subsidies in fisheries or export restrictions to name just a few. The role of trade in promoting structural economic transformation in the last decade, the least developed countries LDCs as a group enjoyed a period of sustained economic growth, microeconomic stability and increased trade and investment. Yet, the sustainability of export-led growth backed by surging prices of exported commodities turn out to be vulnerable in the face of the global economic crisis. Moreover, there are concerns that the pre-crisis period of sustained economic growth did not generate a significant transformation of LDC's economies with the majority of LDC's only achieving 
modest and fragile steps in diversifying their economies, creating jobs and tackling massive poverty. For trade to support structural transformation, however, an appropriate international enabling framework must be in place to provide a level playing field and enable LDCs to overcome their structural handicaps. In addition, as the voice of the international community on international trade, the WTO should accommodate and in fact encourage all approaches and agreements that meet clear and well-defined principles of the international trading system. These principles include consistency with WTO. Agreements should be consistent with the WTO and build on existing WTO obligations where these exist. Inclusion and open exorcism. Participants in any process should be as open and inclusive as possible and be encouraged to permit accession to other countries willing to fulfill the implied responsibilities of any agreement. Special and differential treatment. Agreements should promote economic and technical cooperation recognizing the different stages of development of participants. Special and differential treatment can be justified in circumstances where participants face challenges in benefiting from an increase in trade. Transparency and predictability. Recognizing that the goal is to promote transformative private investment agreements must provide clarity and predictability for investors. These principles contribute to a framework that can guide trade reform and ensure that the WTO is appropriately at the center of the global framework. Improving decision making in the WTO, significant changes will be needed in WTO decision making procedures not only to address developing country grievances but to enhance the organization's ability to conduct its business efficiently. There is clearly much that WTO members can do, acting largely through their trade ministers to make the WTO a more agile decision maker and to give key government and civil society stakeholders more confidence in its work. But there is just as clearly also a limit to what WTO members can do within the organization itself. If the challenges that face the organization are to be understood and fully addressed, the WTO's place in the larger system of global economic governance will have to be considered. We also would expect that the run-up to the meeting and the meeting itself will generate intense media interest and public discussion, improving global public understanding of economic governance challenges. And if, as we expect, the summit initiates an international debate over how to reform the system of global economic governance, the first summit will probably not be the last. The main message of this chapter is that the WTO has been very successful, but that changes need to be made to increase its effectiveness in order to meet the challenges posed by globalization. It is important to understand, however, that the WTO is only one part of a system of global governance that now needs refurbishment and a clear definition of the functions of the various multilateral institutions. Only a combination of internal reforms and changes in the patterns of global governance will ensure that the WTO achieves its full potential. Next, WTO and India. Issues between India and the WTO have come up time and again. Agriculture and intellectual property rights are a few. There is no evidence that India has defaulted on any of our obligations under the TRIPS agreement. India has provided facilities for filing applications under PCT and has facilities for depositing patented microorganisms in a depository as required under the Budapest Treaty. There has been a dramatic increase in filing of applications as well as grant of patents. The number of examiners has gone up to 180 even though it is far below the requirements estimated to be over 300. Infrastructure facilities are slowing coming up and the information system is being systemized and computerized. Questions have been raised on the justifications for linking patents with market approvals by the Drug Controller General of India and Pharmaco economic considerations while granting patents or during litigations involving infringement suits by the patent office. The appellate court or the formal judicial systems, issues on labeling as counterfeit 
of certain generic drugs by foreign customs agencies also raised important issues for the generic manufacturers. Other issues which need immediate attention through legal or administrative procedures are related to provisions for data protection, data exclusivity, anti-competition practices, parallel imports, protection of traditional knowledge, making compulsory licenses simpler, geographical indication to extend rights beyond wines and spirits, implementations of the provisions under the Biodiversity Act, not a TRIPS issue, exploitation of publicly funded research through bipolar like provisions and handling of pre-grant and post-grant opposition cases expeditiously. Many bottlenecks still remain unresolved. Hopefully in the coming years answers will be provided that will take care of most of the stakeholders in a fair and equitable manner. India and the World Trade Organization also signed the Trade Facilitation Agreement TFA and the WTO agree to India's demand for a perpetual peace clause till a final solution to the issue of food stock holding is found. A special meeting was held to take the decision of the WTO General Council, the highest decision making body after ministerial conferences. The GC adopted three main decisions, signing of the TFA protocol, extension of the peace clause for an indefinite period and setting a deadline for the remaining Bali package commitments for poorer countries. Following tense negotiations and last minute hiccups due to oppositions from Argentina and Pakistan. Later, breakthrough came after India and the US reached an understanding where the Americans assured support to India's demand for a permanent peace clause and in turn India agreed to sign the TFA. The TFA expected to infuse $1 trillion into the global economy and create 21 million jobs is open for rectification by all 160 member countries. It was expected to be implemented by July 2015. US Trade Representative Michael Froman said WTO has taken a critical step forward by breaking the impasse that had prevailed since July. I am pleased that the US was able to work with India and other WTO members to find an approach that preserved the letter and spirit of the package of decisions reached at last year's Bali Ministerial Conference. With this win under WTO's belt, we can again focus our efforts on revitalizing the organization's core negotiating function. After a landslide victory, the Bharatiya Janata Party, which came to power at the center in May, had vetoed adoption of the process that would have turned the TFA into a legally binding deal by July 31, the previously set deadline. Since then, the government had been insisting on having a parallel agreement on public food stocks for its poor and marginal farmers. Steps to the Pact 7 December 2013, WTO ninth ministerial concludes in Bali. Members agree to sign TFA. India claims victory for achieving the peace clause for a period of four years that will give it the freedom to provide WTO prohibited subsidies to its poor and marginal farmers. 14 February July 31 fixed as deadline to sign TFA Pact to fully implement it by July 2015. July 31 WTO General Council suspended. India refuses to sign the TFA, demands a parallel agreement on food stock holding. September 29 Preparatory Committee on Trade Facilitation meets. India stays firm on stand. US denies further meetings on TFA. Demanding a pact on food security along with TFA will entail collapse of entire Bali package. 38 September, PM Modi holds first meeting with US President Obama. Both agree on achieving next steps in WTO talks. October 16, Trade Negotiations Committee meets talks inconclusive. November 13, India claims to garner US support on its concern for food stockpiling. November 27, WTO Special General Counsel agrees to TFA implementation and food security peace clause. A permanent peace clause insulates India and other developing countries with public stock holding programs from challenges by other WTO members even for violation of global rules on farm subsidies. The so-called 
peace clause also grants India the freedom to offer subsidies to its farmers without following any limit. The cap according to WTO rules is 10% of the total production of the crops that are covered under the food stock holding program. Hence, at present, India is offering subsidies in the form of minimum support price for rice, wheat and cereals. However, the peace clause does not come for free. India, along with other developing countries, have to adhere to some strict conditions to avail of the interim relief. The most important rider pertains to future food stock holding programs, which would not be covered under this provision. In other words, any new food stock holding program will have to follow WTO's 10% threshold. Another condition is that countries following food stock holding programs will have to ensure they do not distort trade and adversely affect similar schemes of other developing countries. Otherwise, the affected country will have to the option of appealing to the WTO dispute settlement body. Tariff and various restrictions on agriculture also happen to be a major issue of continuous debate. Summary As stated above, although the WTO is an organization of topmost importance as far as international trade is concerned, but various issues still need to be addressed and a lot of issues still require due heed, especially with regard to developing and least developed nations who happen to be an emerging force. Thank you.